this idea of talking to the brain in its own language is, is new, it's cutting edge. I mean, I'm, I'm writing about very cutting edge things. That's Canadian brain researcher Dr. Norman Doidge making waves again. His first book explained the theory of neuroplasticity, the discovery that the brain can change. Now, in a new book, he says he's found evidence the brain can be rewired to help treat people with everything from Parkinson's disease to autism. And he's challenging the medical community to be more supportive of these new approaches. I sat down with him earlier this week. But first, some background. For years, the brain has been described as a machine. I learned that the brain was pretty much hardwired and that what you've got by the age of 18, you're left with. And if damaged, little repair could be done. I was operating from that model, which is that this is a broken brain and it's irretrievably broken. Dr. Norman Doidge is part of a growing sector of mainstream scientific research, throwing that thinking upside down. I'm here today to describe what I've come to believe is the most important change in our understanding of the human brain in 400 years. It's the revolutionary theory of neuroplasticity, that the brain can be repaired, even rewired. The discovery of neuroplasticity is the discovery that our brains can change their structure and function through mental experience alone. He tells the stories of how people with chronic pain, stroke, traumatic brain injury, Parkinson's disease, multiple sclerosis, autism, ADHD, or some kinds of blindness have seen radical improvements by focused thought and movement, training new parts of the brain to take over from damaged ones. Doidge has written all about it in his new book, The Brain's Way of Healing. We met up earlier this week in Toronto. This is such an interesting book. Thank you. You talk about one case, uh, uh, another doctor who had experienced <laughs> many years of chronic neck pain. Yeah. And he was able to cure himself by flooding his brain. Mm. Explain that. Uh, Dr. Michael Moskowitz was a psychiatrist who became a pain specialist. He had the following thought. You know, I've been teaching my residents that there are these switches in the brain that can turn off pain. So it's not the neck that actually hurts. It's the brain sending a signal that your neck hurts. Yeah, I, I mean, it's a whole system, but there are gates that go all the way from the body up to the brain. And if you can stop the signal, then And you... if you can stop the signal, that's what anesthetic does. Um, and drugs also do that. You stop the signal. Um, and you and can do that through a thought he, process. He was able to do that in this situation, and he's since worked with a number of patients, many patients. And I've, I, I wrote about him and his first patient, but I saw many of his patients. and. A lot of them went completely off medication. Some have, they still have very, very damaged body parts, um, but interestingly, they can be pain free. The next chapter is about a fellow in South Africa with Parkinson's who walked off some of his symptoms. Yes. Um, John Pepper was, uh, had his first early symptoms of Parkinson's in his 30s. Instead of losing mobility, he became more mobile. He taught he himself. He became more mo mobile w w which with what he called his conscious walking technique. And What's I've conscious since, walking? Well, just being aware that you're not going to just start to walk, but you're going to lift, you know, lift your right leg, swing it forward at the knee, shift your weight down to your right foot. So in attention. doing that, he was creating, yes. it's, it's, it developing was, a different part of his brain? Yes, he was using that part of his brain to get himself moving. But the second part is key, which is, it turns out walking is really important for the brain. You know, it's only in anatomy textbooks that the brain and the body are separate. In reality, the brain is seamlessly connected to the body. And we know that when animals walk and when people walk, they generate two things that are really crucial for any human being's brain health. They, they generate brain growth factors of several kinds that consolidate the connections between the, the, the nerve cells when we learn or do, do a skill. And they actually generate some new cells in a small part of the brain involved in memory. What's so wonderful about this story is people say, well, maybe that's a one-off. Well, it's not a one-off. We've got major studies coming out now from the Mayo Clinic uh, and, and many other sources showing that uh, Walking programs, movement programs, and exercise programs um, significantly decrease uh, movement problems in Parkinson's patients, and it improves their mood as well. 
and yet he was a, a big deal in the Parkinson's community, and he was kind of kicked out for giving people false hopes. Yeah, um, he, he was actually the head of the, the patient group, and some people saw him moving. They weren't his neurologists. They had never examined him. But, you know, people who are caught in this idea that the brain is fixed, the preneuroplastic view, that it's circuitry is formed and finalized in childhood. I call it the doctrine of the unchanging brain because it's like a doctrine. It's an abstract concept. Um, have a lot of difficulty accepting that activity of various kinds, mental and physical, might actually alter brain structure clinically. A lot of people uh, suffer from autism, ADHD. It's pretty common these days. Mm -hmm. Is it, you say that, that this theory can be applied there as well. How? The, the new research is showing that children with autism have inflammation throughout their bodies. Autism is not just a disease of the brain. It's a whole body disease so that you, affects the you brain. So how do you help that then? Well, the inflamed brain of autistic children, it's very common that it's inflamed, is very underconnected. Now, you might have noticed that autistic children often cover their ears. They, they, they find loud sound, certain kinds of sounds very, very unpleasant and they're hypersensitive to them. And when you walk into a room, it's usually very noisy and then you can sort of focus in on various conversations and that's because the ear has within it an auditory zoom, like a zoom lens on a camera. And that auditory zoom is not working in a lot of autistic children. And so what they hear are not the higher frequencies of human speech, but the low sounds of predators and the kinds of things that you uh, hear when you go see Jaws and there's that, you know, that low rumbling sound. So it's possible to use music that's been modified to actually train that auditory zoom and the brain circuitry involved with that. You've seen kids helped yes, with this? Yes. What kind of difference does it make? Um, one kid who had uh, moderate to severe autism who um, who basically wasn't, had no language, wasn't communicating at all with his parents, no eye contact, temper tantrums all the time. Um, his parents were told he'd be institutionalized and they were broken hearted that they had no relationship with him, but that was the hardest part. After the, in the first week of treatment, he slept for the first time uh, the, the parents could remember. He looked up to his mother after the first or second treatment uh, on the second day, he hugged his father for the first time spontaneously. I mean, so some then why doesn't everybody do this? Why, does not, why don't all the parents with autistic kids come and... Why don't we live in a medical utopia where uh, cutting-edge treatments are but why translated? Aren't other, why aren't all the doctors recommending this then? I think people are too much under the influence of the idea that autism is simply genetic as opposed to a genetic environment interaction. Two, the studies showing the underconnection in autism in the autistic brain are all very recent. Three, this idea of talking to the brain in its own language is, is new, it's cutting edge. I mean, I'm, I'm writing about very cutting edge things, so it takes a while for these things to roll out, and there are still people who were educated, as was I, um, to believe that the brain is hardwired. You say that the mind can alter the brain where is the mind? <laughs> it's not in the brain. <laughs> um, no one knows for sure, I think. Um, often you will see people saying, you know, you are your neurons or your, your thoughts. People say that to me all the time. <laughs> <laughs> you know, your thoughts, you know, this is your, someone will hold up a brain at the beginning of a documentary. This is your brain, you know. Uh, Everything about you, your thoughts, your feelings, and so on and so forth, are here in, in your neurons. That's not true. My take on the reading, uh, my take on the literature, is that most neuroscientists believe that mind is very diffusely distributed through the brain. And some people might argue that even more than that, that maybe part, you know, we have a hundred million neur neurons in our gut. You know, people talk about gut sensations. So your mind could be down here? Well, if you, put, if, if you were to investigate, if you take a person and have them listening to music and you put them in a brain scanner and you look at their brain, you'll see certain areas light up. And then you'll say, the, this is where we process music. 
But if you put their whole body in a brain scan, I've often wondered what would you see lighting up? What other neurons would you see lighting up? Because they're part of the system too. So I think mind will emerge to be some kind of, at least a, dis a distributed proce process. And you know, they're profound philosophical questions. Um, is the mind simply what the brain does? Is it, are, are they interacting? Is the brain tuning into thought? Is the brain um, simply producing it all, or in part is it tuning in? Because our senses are, are tuning into energy and patterns all the time. I, I don't think these questions have truly been resolved, which makes the field very interesting. Hmm. It's been a real pleasure to talk Thank to you. Thank you. Thanks, Dr.